I, I remember in the 60s there was a rock band that was just getting their instruments and stuff ready and they were using these words. <laughs> Can you hear me, uh, Gabe? Okay. Hi? I'm live? Okay. Okay, um, good evening, my, my name is Jim LaBelle Sr., uh, otherwise known as Akpayuk. Uh, my ancestors come from Kotzebue and Norvik uh, area, and with me is Kristen uh, English. We will both uh, be presenting, Kristen will uh, introduce herself. Uh, in, uh, more when she gets started. But before we get on with the program, and I'd like to first uh, 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 want to say that uh, on behalf of Kristen and myself and the Alaska Pacific University, we want to uh, do a land acknowledgement. Uh, we want to uh, let everyone there in uh, that is present here and watching that uh, we are on the unceded lands of uh, the Denina people, and uh, we are grateful for their stewardship, and uh, we will continue to honor their uh, their stewardship to this land. And so, thank you very much, uh, on behalf of the Denina people. We are grateful to be here. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, I'm properly mic'd up. Um, so now, now that we've had our land acknowledgement, um, Jim LaBelle Sr. and myself will proceed with our presentation on Before we get started, I want to do some important thank yous. First, I would like to thank the sponsors of the ANCSA at 50 celebration. Um, today's seminar is just one of a number of presentations and forums that are scheduled to help ce celebrate this auspicious year. APU has received funding to put on this educational series, so we need to thank the Atwood Foundation, Bristol Bay Native Corporation, and Cook Inlet Tribal Council, who all gave support and made this series possible. I would also like to give personal thanks to the many sources of information and inspiration that I've received along the way. I would not have had the confidence to stand up here and give this seminar if I hadn't been so fortunate to hear so many esteemed people from the Alaska Native community and outside of the Alaska Native community speak about ANCSA. And so I have a list of many names up here and I'm sure that there are some that I have forgotten. I'd like to give a special nod to Cook Inlet Region Incorporated. Um, they have done a wonderful job of supporting APU's Alaska Native Executive Leadership Program. And as part of that, they've provided speakers and instructors for our ANCSA course. They've provided videogra videography of our ANCSA speakers, and they've posted that content out on their YouTube channel. And so I've had the opportunity to watch these videos, see those speakers. I've used those videos, and I've assigned them to students in my classes, and they're there as a community resource. Um, 
the, the other names speak, speak for themselves. I will point out the law offices of Landy Bennett Bloomstein. They have been a regular presence at our ANCSA course. And there are some parts of ANCSA that you do really need a lawyer to explain. So they've been a, a wonderful source of knowledge. Um, I've certainly drawn a lot from what I've um, seen of their presentations. So. Um, anyhow, there's a big community of people that have contributed to this to this body of knowledge. My co-presenter, Jim, didn't need as many sources of inspiration and uh, information as I did because he's been there and present for so much of this. Jim gave a little bit of, a present, of an introduction of himself. I've put together some of the kind of bare facts of my esteemed co-presenter. Um, Jim was born in Fairbanks to Inupiaq and French-Irish parents. And I, I took this language from the notes he sent me. He, was for, he has, had forced attendance at two boarding schools, the Wrangell Institute and Sheldon Jackson. And Jim was a, is an alumni of, we can say he was an alumni of APU, but in his era, APU was um, Alaska Methodist University, but still he's got a long tradition with this with our organ, organization. He's held leadership positions at two ANCSA corporations, Port Graham and Chugach, and those two mentions of his professional experience really don't do his experience full justice. He's held numerous professorships at the University of Alaska Anchorage, teaching students about Alaska Native history, ANCSA, cultural traditions, and the like. Um, Jim, is there anything else that you'd like to add to your introduction that I didn't get at? I'm a Vietnam era veteran. He's a Vietnam era veteran. <laughs> Okay, I'll move on from there. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's Kristen English. I'm an assistant professor at APU. I was born in Haines to par uh, one parent of Clinkett Aleut descent, my mother, and Welsh, Irish, Hungarian uh, father, and that's greatly simplifying the ancestry of both of my parents, but that's, that gets the gist of it. I'm an enrolled member of the Central Council of Clinket Haida Association. Uh, my Clinket clan and moiety are eagle killer whale. I'm an original shareholder of Siri, um, Cook Inlet Region, Inc. And as we get further in the presentation, you'll see that that dates me somewhat. And I'm a, a graduate of the University of Arizona and UCLA, so I'm a double business major. I'm not a historian. I'm not in the liber liberal arts program. But like I shared, I've just had the opportunity throughout my career to get exposed to a lot about ANCSA. And it, honestly, if it weren't for the fact that uh, when I asked our elders council if anyone would like to help me with this, that Jim raised his hand, um, that again, you know, I feel confident enough to do this. So I'll be really relying a lot on Jim as we go through this presentation. When we, when we talk about ANCSA, and you can see for, far down in this timeline, we have the passage of ANCSA and ANCSA today. And both Jim and I felt like it was really important to give the lead up to ANCSA because just looking at the legislation as it was enacted in 1971 really doesn't tell the story. We have to start back much further in time than that in order to understand all of the meaningfulness and the essence of the compromise that was ANCSA. So we have a section on evidence of indigenous people's continued use and occupation. We have a section on non-indigenous occupation, and when we get to that part, we had to expand our timeline because a lot happened in that um, non-indigenous occupation era. We've got a section where we talk about Alaska Native unity, organization, and advocacy because there was this condensed period of activism on the part of Alaska Natives that was really important to getting ANCSA passed with as favorable terms as we did. And then finally, we get into the passage of ANCSA. So we have a pretty ambitious outline of information to cover before we get to ANCSA. We'll be watching the time to make sure that when we get near about the halfway point, that we'll speed up so we can actually tell you about ANCSA.
And Jim, I know you'll let me know when, whenever you're going to jump in and, and stop me from talking. I wanted to start out with um, some information from a paper that was written by Willie Hensley prior to the passage of ANCSA. And this is, the name of the paper is there. This is a really good paper. It's something that you can find on a last cool or any kind of general Google search. And the, the way Mr. Hensley described the questions surrounding land is, you know, he said it's politically volatile, an administrative tangle, a judicial granny knot. So you can just get the feeling for all of the complexities that were surviving um, land issues. Um, from the very beginning of American occupancy of Alaska, and actually throughout the United States, the status of natives in regard to land was left in limbo. In addition to that, in addition to issues surrounding land issue, citizenship, um, Mr. Hensley describes that as the opposite side of the coin in private land ownership, was also in a highly confused state. It took a while for Alaska Natives to get citizenship, and then it wasn't the same type of citizenship that other groups had, as you'll see as we go, throughout, go, out throughout this, go further in this presentation. There is a common law concept um, when it comes to land rights. It can be referred to as aboriginal title, aboriginal rights, aboriginal land rights. And it stands for the proposition that indigenous people that are discovered by colonizers have a right to the land that they continuously used and occupied. And there was this was known, this is something that came up in the lower 48 as well, but there was an effort in Alaska prior to ANCSA just really not to deal with these issues. When it comes to determining the aboriginal rights of our people here in Alaska, there's ample evidence to prove this continuous use and occupancy. There's evidence of Alaska Native heritage going back 25,000 years. And this is the fundamental baseline for who owns the land. I've mentioned these common law principles. This spells it out in a little more detail. But it, it holds that Alaska Natives, due to their habitation of and use of natural resources, and this can be timber, fish, berries, um, not, not, they weren't drilling for oil yet, um, you know, or, or mining for, for minerals yet, but the, the natural resources and how they migrated across Alaska in order to get to these resources, that this is evidence that these people um, have aboriginal title to land and its products, which cannot de be deprived them without their consent. And this is again from Willie Hensley from that same paper. Mr. Hensley said that at that time, there were really two schools of thought. This is kind of the pre anxa days. One was that Alaska Natives were citizens just like any other citizen, and they had to go about obtaining their land in the way that citizens normally would. They would buy it. Um, the other side of the argument was that Alaska Natives are the rightful landowners of almost all of Alaska. We continuously used and occupied about 90% of it, and so therefore that is our land. And this was um, the, the two extreme schools of thought um, going out throughout the state of Alaska. When, when it comes to examining the Alaska Native cultures and again adding to the evidence of Aboriginal land rights, uh, there's evidence not just of the people but of these sophisticated societies that the Alaska Native people had developed over time. One of the ways that you can look at the sophistication of a society is to look at the development of the language. And so here we see first evidence of language going back 11,500 years um, where we had just one language group and then we see that splitting out into Aleut, Inupiaq, Yupik, splits out even further to these different Aleut groups. 
And when, when an examination is done of the language, you really get a insights into the way the society lived, the way in which they governed themselves, the way in which there were agreements amongst tribes and people in the sharing of the resources. This is an, another look at another section of the Alaska Native language history. The Nan Dene language also dates back over 14,000 years, and at that time, the evidence points to one primary language, which it started to split off over the years. And when you look at the top, you see the names that we're more familiar with, Haida, Klinkit, uh, Iak, and, and so forth. And so again, you see not just evidence of the people, um, these languages followed certain migration patterns, so it helped map out the land use. And, it, and you see the sophistication of the people who developed this language. And this is kind of important to keep in the back of your mind when you see things, uh, pieces of law and other documents that refer to Alaska Natives as uncivilized tribes. Uncivilized by whose standards? Because this points to very great civilizations, um, very sophisticated. They had systems of justice, they had systems of sharing, they had family systems. Um, so there was no uncivilization as, as far as we can tell with the Alaska Natives going this far back in time. Those same language groups that I showed you in development, they started to establish, and this is archaeological work, not someone with a double business major work, but these language groups established relatively clear boundaries along the language areas. In this map, um, when, when we show you how the land was divided post ANCSA, you'll see some real similarity between these language borders and the way in which the state was divided into the 12 regional ANCSA corporations. Okay, so that was our kind of real quick glance at the evidence of indigenous people's continued use and occupation. Now we need to switch to non-indigenous occupation to start to get this picture how um, Alaska Natives people's rights, their rights to lands, um, started to erode over time. And th this is where um, Jim LaBelle is going to have a, uh, a lot to say because he's very familiar with this as the, as the events unfold. So I said that we would be expanding the timeline when we got to this section. You can see I've got a long list of um, events, I guess is the best word to describe, describe them, starting from Russian occupation all the way out to Alaska statehood. And at each interval along the way, some really important things happened that shaped the future of Alaska Natives and their land rights. I think most people know that uh, some of the first people to come to Alaska were the Russians. Um, so I call this Russian occupation and colonization of Alaska. Uh, Russian crews landed on the Alaskan coast about 1741. Um, and, and they started over a hundred years of, Alaska, of Russian dominance over native peoples. Uh, a lot of things happened under the Russians. Um, when they first came to the region, Alaska was home to about 100,000 100, Alaska native people, including Inuit, Athabasca, and Yupik, and so on. And there were about 17,000 alone on the Aleutian Islands. The Russians came for the resources. They had an eye on the seals in particular, not that they were opposed to taking other resources. And they could quickly saw that the Aleut hunters um, could get the seal better than they could. And so male Aleut hunters were taken from their homes and families um, and sent to other places to hunt seal. There are stories of the Russians sending Aleuts on expeditions as far down as California um, and bringing the bounty back. 
Um, there are stories of the Russians. They had a battle with the Clinket. They went, went down once to Sitka to wage war on the Clinkets, and they lost. And so they came back with the Aleuts, forced them to do their fighting for them. So this was not, um, th this was not a great time for um, Alaska Native people under, under the occupancy of Russia, great disruption to the family lives, a lot of lives lost. There was introduction of disease. The Aleut pop population declined by about 80% during the first and second generations of Russian contact. After the Russians decided that they were not interested in Alaska anymore. Um, they stopped seeing it, stopped seeing it as a great source of um, economic power for Russia, and so they worked out a deal with the United States to sell Alaska to them. Of course, from the Alaska Native perspective. This was a non-sale. This was a sale that shouldn't have happened. The Russians never owned Alaska. The Alaska natives did. Um, so how could they sell something that they didn't own? Nevertheless, they did. Um, and the United States bought Alaska from the Russians. And there was a document called the Treaty of Session that governed this sale. What's really interesting about the Treaty of Session is it, that it recognized three groups of people. One were Russians who wanted to stay Russian citizens, and so they were told, you can stay in Alaska, but you gotta be out of here in three years. If there was another group of Russians who said, I don't really wanna go back to Russia, I like Alaska. And so the United States said, that's fine, um, you can stay here. You've got to become a U.S. citizen. We, you know, we don't want Russian citizens staying here. Um, and then they could enjoy um, what, what the treaty said was the rights and immunities of U.S. citizens. So they had a path forward to citizenship. Then there was this other group that the Treaty of Sessions had to deal with, and this was the uncivilized tribes. And so the uncivilized tribes would be subject to such laws and regulations as the United States may, from time to time, adopt in regard to aboriginal tribes of that country. So they mentioned Alaska Natives. They made it clear that they weren't citizens. They made it clear that they weren't even on the same footing as the Russians. And, and they said, and we can do whatever we like with regard to laws and regulations, and you uncivilized tribes will need to do as we say, more or less. So this was the Treaty of Session. Something else that is in the background, and it's not actually on my timeline, that's important for all tribes and also for Alaska Natives we have to look at the Constitution. And so the Constitution, um, when it was drafted, it was clear there were tribes, uncivilized tribes, domestic dependent nations. There was a lot of terminology that was used to describe the tribes. And so the Constitution granted Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Um, what, what was clear um, as time went on was that this overarching commerce clause meant essentially that the federal government was in charge of anything to do with Indians. If they needed to move them from one area of the lower 48 and send them out west along the tri Trail of Tears, that was commerce. If they needed to group them up onto a reservation and say this is your new homeland, that was commerce. And so the federal government really had complete but not absolute power over the tribes. And it really would take a lawyer to explain the difference between complete and absolute power. But either word, it means it's you know pretty darn um, powerful and that the tribes clearly don't have a lot of say. One important thing that the Constitution also did was that it made clear that it was the federal government 
who had this plenary power over the tribes, and the federal power over, over the tribes would always preempt state power. And in some ways, that's still true to this day. Another piece of, of the Constitution that's important is that that Commerce Clause and that plenary power that's defined in the Constitution, it led to laws that prohibited the sales of Indian land to any party but the federal government. And so, yes, lower 48 tribes were granted lands, Indian country, reservations, and they could do much of what they liked on this land, but they didn't really own it. It's held in trust by the federal government. And so there are no, it's not like you and I when we own a piece of land and we have a, a deed or some type of fee simple document. All of this land is still really connected to the federal government, and if any changes on that land need to be made, you need to go through a bureaucratic process. Um, skipping ahead a, a little bit in time and going to something that applies more specifically to Alaska, in 1872, the Mining Act was passed. It took a couple years after 1872 for them to amend it to say that it specifically applied to Alaska, but this is when the act was passed. And it outlined the rules and regulations involved with land and load claims. We have all can picture the gold panders, panners staking out their claims, and I get to dig everything in this area. Um, you can also think of it as one of the first legislated discriminations against Alaska Natives. Remember, at this point in time, Alaska Natives are not U.S. citizens. And so, um, in Section 1 of the Mining Act, it's very clear, it very clearly states that only U.S. citizens may claim land and load, and this essentially excluded natives from their own property. And there were no laws in place at the time to say that someone couldn't stake out a claim on what was tribal land. And of course, tribal people, they didn't have titles. There was common understanding. There was traditions that governed who owned the land and who got to use it and how it was going to be shared. So Alaska Natives really didn't have any way to tell these miners who were staking their claims that, no, you can't do that. I own the land. Because they'd say, where's your title? Title? What's a title? You know, at, at, at that stage of, of the development. So this was, again, not a good thing for Alaska Natives. Going a little bit more with this concept, and I bring Willie into this presentation a bit, um, it, in one of the articles that he wrote, he said that in the Alaska Native culture, there really was no concept of private property prior to Western occupation and colonization. Um, so after Russia sold Alaska to the United States, it was the missionaries who were ta tasked with assimilation. So when we have all the, these land claims um, or, or loss of land claims circling about, we also have this other forces coming into the state of Alaska in the form of churches and missionaries. Churches and missionaries were also able to select land um, when, in, when there was little separation between church and state, the missionaries and the churches claimed a lot of what was Alaska Native land for their own so they could kind of set up camp to start to do their assimilation work. Um, going on down through the, the timeline, another important um, piece of information was the Organic Act of 1884. And this started to lay the groundwork for Alaska Native land claims. It didn't go that far. Um, it created the District of Alaska and a district court. And it, the Organic Act was actually an extension of laws that were in place in Oregon. And they just said, well, those will work for Alaska too. So we got a similar Organic Act to the state of Oregon. Um, it named, it charged the Secretary of Interior, a, a federal department, with the responsibility of educating school-age children in Alaska regardless of race. 
In this act, because Alaska was designated as a mining district, the Organic Act provided that Indians or other persons in said district shall not be disturbed in the possessions of lands actually in use or occupation, but the terms under which such person may acquire titles to such land is reserved for future legislation by Congress. So it gets kind of confusing. It says that, well, you really should, you really should not disturb the Alaska Natives if they say this is their homeland, if they say this is their village, um, you know, try not to bother them. But people did bother them, people did get them to move off, and it says that the only way that these problems can be solved is for the Alaska Natives to somehow get to Congress and pr plead their case, and there just really wasn't any mechanism for doing so. Um, the act also said that miners and missionaries could retain their land claims even if they were on land previously used and occupied by Indian tribes. So it was like they took and they didn't have to give back. And so it's like a little bit of a one step forward, one and a half steps back whenever these important pieces of legislation come out. So it made provisions for land claims, but it really didn't have many teeth to it. Something else that happened in the early 1900s was the Alaska Native Allotment Act. And this was recognition on the federal government's part that there were individuals in Alaska, Alaska Natives, who deserved to have some land deeded to them. And so it authorized the Secretary of Interior to do these land allotments of up to 160 acres. But the benefits were limited. In the period between 1906 and 1960, only 80 allotments were approved out of the over 200 that were applied for. And when you think of the large, large number of Alaska Natives who would have felt a right to these allotments, that the number of applications is so low says something about the barriers associated with actually applying for this, and then you have the low approval rate. So it was clearly a very onerous process in order to get this land. In 1912, Alaska became a U.S. territory. This gave Alaska representation in the federal government. We got a congressional delegate. And the, the new governor of the territory, he had a charge to set up education systems in the state of Alaska. And here again, you see that division between federal and state powers. So under the, care, under the governor, he established schools for white children, children of mixed blood leading a civilized life. So if you were a less than 100% Alaska Native of the mixed blood and you were you know, not considered to be uncivilized, whatever that meant, then you could attend school with the white children. Native schools, though, were still under the jurisdiction of the federal government, as much to this day really remains under the, federal, under the jurisdiction of the federal government. Another important piece of les legislation, the Indian Citizenship of 1924. So all this time in Alaska Natives still aren't citizens, signed into law by Pre President Calvin Coolidge, extended citizenship, um, but even after passage, state and lo local jurisdictions could prevent Native Americans from voting. So this, on a state-by-state -state basis, um, states, either work to prevent Alaska Natives and other people of color from voting or some of the progressive ones were early to adopt and to let people into the voting booths. But it was not until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that Native Americans could vote in all 50 states. Am I leaving anything out here, Jim? From my perch, I can't see you very well. <laughs> okay. Well, you just give a holler whenever, whenever you need to, to add. I'm, I'm feeling a, a little like I, have, I might have a <laughs> As I told Jim, I said, well, I've, I've finally gotten over being nervous now that you're here on my, here doing this with me. And he made a joke. He said, oh, don't worry. When you tell me you're nervous, I'll just say, I'll be behind you all the way. 
Um, there was an Alaska Native Townsite Act of 1926, and this again was kind of a lot of words saying that, you know, we're going through these efforts, I feel like, to make it seem like we're giving Alaska Natives a, a, a chance to own some land. And so it was designed to give Alaska Natives small lots under their homes in villages. Um, Again, if they were given those lots, they were considered inalienable. So they couldn't be taken away or sold without the approval of the federal government. So they kind of owned these native allotments, but they didn't own them to the extent that if they ever needed cash, they couldn't just sell off an acre or two to raise some money. They had to go through a long involved process to get the approval from the federal government. This act was terminated in, in 1976, which was both a good thing and a bad thing because it meant that that, that ended the period, what period where Alaska Natives could apply for allotments. There are still some creeping through the courts that were filed for before this time, and that's just how long the bureaucracy can take to make these things happen. Another important piece of legislation that happened was the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934. And while this doesn't apply specifically to land claims, it led the way to some important recognition of the Alaska Native groups. It ended the allotment area, era, which was thought to lead to the erosion of Indian-owned land. And that was more of a lower 48 phenomenon. The lower 48 went through an era, era, era. They set up reservations, and that worked for kind of the groups, um, you know, in the communities. But then they also made individual allotments to American Indians. And in this case, those allotments were held closer to fee simple. American Indians could sell them, but what happened was American Indians up to that point hadn't been great participants in the cash economy. So they owned land, they had to pay taxes on their land. That was one of the um, downsides of getting out from under the federal government. So they owned, owed taxes. If they got behind on their taxes that they had to pay in cash, sometimes the only way to come up with the cash was selling the land. And so a lot of really nice lower 48 Indian allotments were sold in hardship sales um, for less than they were worth to opportunistic people. You can look on, the, on you know, Google and find headlines from back in the day talking about great Indian lots going for pennies on the dollar. So it was really a time of great explo exploitation. Um, the good things um, about Indian Reorgan the Indian Reorganization Act is it was intended to promote the exercise of tribal self-governing powers. It recognized tribal government and encouraged adoption of tribal constitutions. There are about a hundred tribes in Alaska that chose to organize under the Indian Reorganization Act, and there are a couple options with tribes and how they can go about it. But this was an attempt to give that um, self-determination self and recognition of sovereignty to tribes. Um, it was in 1936 that it was amended to let Alaskan Native villages organize their tribal govern governments under the, under the act. Jim, this is one, the, the Indian Claims Commission Act, that I feel like you might be able to do better justice to than, than I can. Um, I know that this act was one of the first attempts at the federal level to give Alaska Natives and American Indians a way to petition the courts to right some of the wrongs that had transpired um, with land dealings in the past. Prior, prior to the Indian claims, the federal government could take any Indian land that they wanted for no compensation. Um, and they didn't have to go through, you know, the process of eminent, eminent domain to do so. This Indian Claims Act um, allowed tribal people to petition the federal government and say that um, they had had land taken for inadequate compensation in the past. 
Between 1920 and 1946, there were nearly 200 claims filed, um, but only 29 were successful in receiving damages. It was meant to dispose of the Indian claims, Indian really land claims problem with finality, but it really didn't. Do you have anything you want to add here? Yeah, they were one of the first to do so, and we'll see later in the presentation that that came back to hurt them in, in another way. But, okay. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip back, skip past a couple other slides on that. Next big thing that happened that impacted Alaska natives, natives is when Alaska became a state. And so... You know, big headlines. You can see lots of examples of how everyone across the state was so excited. Woohoo, we've become a state. Um, right off the bat, when Alaska became a state, the federal government let them know that this, this now um, gives you the rights to select 103 acres of vacant, unappropriated, and unreserved, unreserved late land. Um, excuse me. Um, Alaska Natives, sensing that the state getting to choose 103 million acres was not going to be good for all of the land claims that they were trying to assert for themselves, they really saw this as a rallying cry for them to, get, to start getting organized. Now they didn't just have to deal with getting fair treatment from the federal government, they had this new beast to deal with, and that was the state of Alaska who had a right to pick 103 acres. And from the state of Alaska's initial perspective, they thought, well, all I have to do is negotiate with the federal government, the largest landholder in Alaska. And they really weren't inclined to even recognize the fact that Alaska Natives also had claims to the land. Okay. Um, that ends our section on non-indigenous occupation. So you can see that all the way up to statehood, um, Alaska Natives still really hadn't established, uh, there hadn't been any fair means from the federal government or the state government for dealing with the land claims in Alaska. So the, the next section that we'll be talking about is this period in time that was really important leading up to ANCSA, where Alaska Natives really saw a need to come together and be united, get organized, and get ready to fight and advocate for the land claims that they deserved. This is just one timeline um, of events that happened, um, and I've got some other takes on this. Back in 1867, um, the Clinkets were the first to formally protest the sale of Alaska as they were the owners of the land that they occupied. That protest didn't necessarily go anywhere or achieve anything, but they were on record, um, and that was very important. In 1912, Tanana Chiefs, um, a, a group from the kind of Fairbanks and surrounding area, they asserted their aboriginal right to land because settlers were infringing on traditional hunting and fishing areas. And so again, you know, I talked about how Alaska Natives didn't have title to the land. They didn't have any Western type of proof that showed that they owned this land and had always. So people were just putting their homesteads wherever they saw fit. And of course, choosing out the best, uh, best property from their perspective. So Tanana chiefs started showing up in the courts. Um, in 1935, under the Court of Claims Act, um, Clinkett sued to reclaim land taken for the Tongass National Forest. Um, they considered very much for that to be their land. It took um, until 1959 for Clinkett and Haida to secure a judgment for that 1935 suit. Um, 
And in this case, it was an important precedent setter because um, the, the amount that the Clinkett and Haida people won wasn't, was not considered to be fair compensation, but at least it set an important legal precedent, and that was that the courts acknowledged that the Treaty of Sessions, the, the, the one that governed the sale of Alaska to Russia, did not extinguish aboriginal title. So that was really important going forward. Um, in 1968, Clinkett and Haida, so they secured a judgment in 1935. Oh, I'm sorry, in 1935. They filed in 35, they got a judgment in 59, and then it took until 1968 that they were actually paid for the land that they were making claims against. But the, the, the question is, and I know what the Clinkets would say, you know, what would you have preferred to have, your land back or the money? Definitely the land, and that's not just because they got an unfair price of only $3 an acre for the land, but it's because it was never about the money for them. It was about getting back their ancestral homelands. Anything to add to that, Jim? Okay. <laughs> I, I put this up here just in case anyone in the audience doesn't know that there was this really kind of dark period in Alaska Native history where we had our own Jim Crow laws, signs of uh, no natives, no dogs, and establishment. Here's an Alaskan picture where they're advertising all white help because God forbid that anyone should go into a dirty little cafe and see an Alaska Native working there. <laughs> um, I know from my own family history, my father met my mother in Southeast Alaska, and he tells stories of being met at the door with his you know, beautiful bride and being told, sorry, we, we won't serve her. You know, my father just being horrified by this. This was in the mid-1950s in Juneau or Sitka. So a lot of discrimination happening to Alaska Natives, shut out of the workforce, shut out of the cash economy, shut out of owning land, you know, treated, you know, put in the same category of dogs when it came to being allowed into institutions. So when we talk about the important Alaska Native advocates, um, we've got the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood, and um, I, I, I need to just go down a rabbit hole and just learn more about this group. Like, I know that they did wonderful things, but the more I read, the more I wanted to know. From their website, they consider themselves to be, I see one of my famous typos here, um, the oldest known indigenous persons civil rights organization in the world. And that's a pretty great uh, claim to fame. The Alaska Native Brotherhood was founded in 1912, and the Sisterhood was founded in 1916. They were one of the important early voices in the fight for Alaska Native rights. Um, they were instrumental in making sure that the um, Voting Rights Act extended, actually extended voting rights to Alaska Natives. They boycotted places that had the no native signs. They were really instrumental in getting the right people together to, to, to make an organization like theirs. This, this was, it started out a primarily Southeast Alaska organization. It expanded its boundaries, but they were one of the first groups to realize that if, if we want to have a fair land claim settlement act, we need to be organized across all of Alaska. We need to bring people together from all the way up north, down to see southeast, you know, the tip of the Aleutians, that we need to stand together. So we can give a lot of credit to the Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood for giving that impetus for Alaska Native groups to get started. Um, also important in the um, fight for Alaska Native's rights, Elizabeth Paradovich aids in the anti-discrimination effort. I think that um, this quote of hers is, is pretty famous by, by this time. Um, you know, I would not have expected that I, who am barely out of savagery, would have to remind gentlemen with 5,000 years of recorded civilization behind them of our Bill of Rights. <laughs> 
Um, and they asked her things like, well, come on, what's the point of this? Do you really think this anti-discrimination bill is going to end discrimination? And so she said, and I paraphrase, well, you have laws on the books that prevent um, stealing. Do you really think that that means no one's ever going to steal? So no law will eliminate crimes, but at least you as le legislators can assert to the world that you recognize the evil of the present situation and speak your intent to help us overcome discrimination. So a lot of really... Um, important leaders in that time. This is the actual signing of the anti-discrimination bill. Governor Greening signed it and pictured here um, Elizabeth Paradovich. She's a little bit blurry. She's got her husband Roy Paradovich, um, also very instrumental in this, signing this really important piece of legislation. This I, I throw in just as a kind of a point of interest, but the Anti-Discrimination Act certainly did not erase all discrimination or barriers for Alaska Natives. Um, here in the Anchorage area, up through the 1950s and beyond, there were restricted covenants associated with some neighborhoods. So I've got a couple here showing that in Airport Heights, it was on the books that only white families could buy property in Airport Heights. It was the same with Turnagain. It was actually the same in Rogers Park, where I went to school from uh, kindergarten to fourth grade. And I think the only reason that we were able to pull that off is that my dad was white, and he probably was the only one showing up at the bank to sign the loan papers, because that was kind of the way you did things in those days. And so my mom was not really a, a face in this, in this transaction. Of course, I didn't find that out till much later, but it does make me, uh, it kind of light bulb went off, and it's like, oh, that's why we were the only family that kind of looked like ours in that neighborhood. <laughs> you know, we didn't know that we were in this whites only neighborhood at the time, but we were. Something else going on in this era and something else that really uh, lit a fire with Alaska Natives to get together and stand up for their rights was that there was a lot of different regulation going on concerning Alaska Native subsistence. I'm not sure that that word existed in the same way then, but a lot of regulation of Alaska Natives' traditional ways of hunting and gathering. Most of it saying you can't do your traditional hunting and gathering gathering in the way that you want to at the time that you want to. So the state and federal government began imposing regulations. There's one pretty famous story about how in 1961, federal agents arrested two Inupiat hunters at Barrow for hunting waterfowl out of season. And for, you know, since time immemorial, there had been one time of year where uh, this was the time where they got a certain type of waterfowl. And in the new hunting regulations, their, their time to, to get to stock up for the, the long cold winter, they weren't allowed to do, to do that. And so a couple hunters were arrested for killing birds out of season. This led to what was called the Duck Inn and so after the arrest of a local hunter, a group of 138 men, women, and even children <laughs> presented themselves to the local magistrate, each of them holding an out-of-season waterfowl in their hand, and said, okay, go ahead, throw the book at us. They just wanted to make a point. No arrests were made at that point, and the charges were dropped um, against the original hunter. Um, I think one of the, the um, biggest things that happened in this era of activism and organization was the formation of AFN. This was a statewide organization formed by Alaska Natives, and at the first convention, 
um, th this, this group of Alaska Natives who had many times been at opposite sides of issues, they realized that if they didn't stand as one voice, they just weren't going to make a dent in the federal and the state government. And so they were able to gather and make unanimous recommendations to, I guess, the powers that be, both the federal and the state government. They wanted the Department of the Interior to freeze all disposals of federal land pending a land claim settlement. That actually happened. Secretary of State, or Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall, did freeze the conveyance of state selected lands. Um, eventually, Congress passed a law to settle land claims. Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, these were recommendations. Um, they, they wanted Congress to pass a law to settle land claims. They, they recognized that this was going to have to be done at the federal le level. And they recommended that Alaska Natives should be consulted before the passage of any such law. Any comments here, Jim? Okay. So AFN is the largest statewide native organization in Alaska. They represent more than 140 native people, which is about one out of every five Alaskans. They were formed just to primarily um, settle land claims, but they continue to be one of the principal forums and voices of addressing Alaska natives in addressing critical issues of public policy and government. Their mission is to, it recognizes that Alaska Native people began as full members of sovereign nations and continued to enjoy a unique political relationship with the federal government. Um, some of that language speaks to tribes, and we'll talk about how ANCSA didn't necessarily create the tribes, um, but AFN is, is very much involved in regional corporations, village corporations, and tribes. Um, they, their mission is to have our people survive and prosper as distinct ethnic and cultural groups and participate fully as members of the overall society. AFN's mission is to enhance and promote the cultural, economic, and political voice of the entire Alaska Native community. And if anyone's ever had the opportunity of not just attending an AFN convention, but sitting in for the process that's delegates only when it comes time to pass the resolutions, um, they have a very formal process. Um, they have a way of getting feedback that respects all of the different viewpoints of the audience. You know, there are floor debates and resolutions passed when they're carried by a majority of people on the floor. So they still work to achieve as much consensus and possible as possible when they uh, speak on the behalf of Alaska Natives. This is Willie Hensley talking about um, 1966 AFN meeting. It was momentous in that it was the first statewide gathering of Alaska Natives in history. We had representation from every major tribal gr group, and that had not occurred before. And I've got in bold, we were united in the face of massive land selections authorized under the Statehood Act, and remember, once statehood happened, the federal government said, you know, as your prize, you, you, you get to select, I think it was 103 million acres from our federal land bank. So they saw that this put not just their lands at risk, but their future as distinct peoples of Alaska. And, you know, for Alaska Natives, their culture and their ways and being are so intricately tied to the land that you really can't see how the cultures, how the languages, how the family structures could survive if the land base was taken away. So there was a lot more at stake here than just the financial value of the land that people wanted. Um, Alaska Natives, as, as they formed and, and organized, they put forth a number of proposals on 
um, land claims. There was a special task force on Alaska Native land claims that provided a vehicle. And this was actually a congressionally formed task force. And it solved one of the problems that Alaska Natives were having in that they didn't have a lot of money for plane tickets and Washington, D.C. hotel rooms. So people on this task force actually received some type of stipend and per diem for participating in it. The stories are told that even so, people were still running bake sales and doing all of those things so that they could buy a couple more plane tickets to send more people down there and that people were, it, it was not uncommon at all to have four or five people sharing a hotel room, but it was just so important to get people down to DC where they could be heard. Um, these proposals, they knew that they wanted to depart from past Indian policy. They didn't want to replicate what they had seen going on in the lower 48 with Indian reservations and lands that were held in trust by the federal government. Um, some things that the task force sought, they wanted a 10% royalty in perpetuity on the revenue that came from statewide resources. I personally think that sounded more than fair because they did own 90% of the land. And so if they, you know, but that, that didn't happen. Um, at the end of all of this, um, after considering a lot of different options, creating corporations emerged as the only feasible alternative to the creation of a reservation system here in Alaska. This is um, a, a slide from Don Wright. He was then the president of AFN when all of this happened. Um, he testified in front of, front of Congress. He wanted a 60-acre bill. Um, you'll see in a slide or two that uh, under ANCSA, it wasn't 60 million acres that was granted, it was 40 something, but this is what was asked for. And I love his quote, we are not asking for anything. We are actually offering the US government 84% of our property. And that I think was pretty darn nice of them to give so much to the federal government. We are offering them, and again, talking about the federal and I guess the state government too, more than 300 million acres to satisfy the needs of others in the state and to satisfy the needs of the U.S. in the way of federal reserves and wildlife refuges. Um, and so we are merely, we are asking merely to be able to re retain 16% of our land um, and 2% royalty in perpetuity, which will be utilized over the whole state of Alaska. Well, they didn't get all that, but, um, you know, just, just remember, um, when we think about what was given to Alaska Natives from ANCSA, um, nothing. It was the other way around. We gave to the federal government. I think it's important too, and I have this slide up here, when we think about the Alaska Native groups and the efforts to organize and to advocate, that we also had a lot of help from outside of the Alaska Native community. A lot of stories told of lawyers who provided their services pro bono. They saw that Alaska Natives had been the underdog, that they had you know, a lot of right on their side and they wanted to help Alaska Natives develop the sophistication to be able to um, be taken seriously across the table from seasoned Washington professionals. So when Alaska Natives went to Washington, they also often had a number of lawyers who were often serving in a pro bono capacity. Another person who made some really compelling testimony um, in support of ANCSA and in support of moving the land claims process along was Elmer Rasmussen. And so, and Elmer Rasmussen of the Rasmussen Foundation. And so this is part of his testimony. And he said that the settlement should be treated not just as an extinguishment of a debt, however legal or moral that obligation would be. So he's saying, you know, I know those arguments are happening, but that's not what necessarily all that we need to focus on. 
but he saw this land claim settlement as a social program of the most practical application. And he wanted to enable a vital part of our Alaskan population to participate in our development and contribute their leadership. And at this time in the late 60s, some of the reports on the socioeconomic status of Alaska Natives are really very alarming. Um, and I'll show some of those, but 60% unemployment rate, um, extreme poverty, much lower education rates. And so Alaska Natives were about 20% of the state, but we really weren't given an opportunity to fully contribute to the state. So I think that Mr. Rasmussen was very very wise to look at Alaska Natives and say we are the greatest undeveloped resource and that you know by chance passage of a land claim settlement act will finally let these people realize their potential and be full, full participants in the state of Alaska which is going to be not just a good thing to the Alaska Natives but to the state of Alaska as a whole okay anything to to add on to that. We, we don't have much time. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> there, is a, there is a lot of things that um, just for everyone's um, just for everyone's information, uh, uh, Kristen and I didn't have a chance to totally flesh out each other's uh, contributions to this presentation but there are there are other things that um, uh, help create awareness about a need for a claims and um, I wanted to um, make sure you understood that um, at the time <clears throat> that AFN got started in 1966 um, it was specifically uh, to fight for a land claims and um, it was the overwhelming uh, focus. And, uh, and I, I have to have you uh, think about how a little group of Alaska Native people leaders could, in, could insert themselves into the national consciousness in terms of uh, making this a, uh, an issue that was important to uh, for our Congress and our president to sign on uh, with. And uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, the nation was embroiled in the, the Vietnam, War, Vietnam War. There was the, uh, uh, the farmers' rights uh, fight that was going on. There was the Equal Rights Amendment that was being fought on a national basis. Certainly the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act were also in uh, all they were all uh, clamoring for a, a part of our nation's consciousness, and uh, I have to really applaud people like uh, Willie Hensley and Emil Nadi and and some of the other Native leaders around Alaska that, um, because of their unity, w was able to insert their collective selves into our national con uh, consciousness to a point where we did get a, a, a land settlement. And uh, it's very important to understand that what Don Wright said is very important. You know, if you translate it, uh, we as Native people were not given anything. We, in fact, gave up everything and chose to retain what we could. And so uh, anytime you hear anyone saying that Alaska Native people were given this or given that, that's totally erroneous. And I would. I would educate them uh, to the contrary. Uh, <clears throat> I think also other things that were happening in Alaska um, occurred uh, that outside of uh, the, the slide presentation that uh, were regional in nature but yet contributed to uh, this creating of awareness and for a, a need to have uh, local control over our our own selves, our own communities. And uh, the Barrow Duck Inn is a very good example of a treaty that was uh, enacted in 1910, 1916, somewhere in that time frame. And 
It was an international treaty between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. I think later it uh, included Russia, but through all of that, uh, no Alaska Native people were ever included in the discussion about what this uh, treaty should look like. Uh, and so instead, we have, it took a, a game warden to arrest a, a young father who had children, uh, you know, he wanted to feed his family in violation of that treaty uh, in 1961 uh, to help create this awareness that here's some distant government uh, trying to enact things that were turned out to be pretty detrimental to, to our way of life. Uh, the other thing I want to mention that was important to the interior uh, was the Rampart Dam uh, project. Uh, many of you uh, may or may not know that uh, the Department of Commerce and uh, other de uh, departments in our uh, nation's uh, government thought it would be a great idea to dam the Yukon River to create a uh, generation of electrical power uh, to extract resources from the interior of Alaska. And if you can imagine a lake that this dam would create would go from uh, Wasilla to Fairbanks. It would become uh, it essentially uh, equal to one of the great lakes in the Midwestern uh, United States. It would totally bury eight or nine Gwich'in villages along the Yukon River. Uh, their hunting grounds, their sacred places, their, uh, would just go underwater. And if it weren't for the Tanana Chiefs Conference and other leaders in the interior who really fought uh, voracious, voraciously against that, um, that would have been uh, a, a taking of enormous proportions. And um, But what it did do to serve, uh, although they did decide to put it on the shelf uh, that was never really fully extinguished uh, until much later. Uh, but we have to, uh, what, what it did create was again an awareness. Uh, here are some distant uh, regulations and rules and agencies wanting to take control. And then the other one I'll mention of course is the uh, Project Chariot. Project Chariot was a uh, a brainstorm uh, of a uh, guy named Edward Teller who thought it would be a great opportunity uh, to use uh, thermonuclear weapons to bomb and create a deep water port near the village of Point Hope so that again it could extract the natural resources from the interior and like the Rampart Dam and like the Barrow Duck Inn uh, they never bothered to, to tell the people of, uh, of Point Hope or uh, some other surrounding villages that this was in the, the process. And uh, if it wasn't for, uh, again, rising up and, uh, and creating uh, uh, an organization called the Tundra Times, which was used uh, with Howard Rock from the village of Point Hope, to kind of uh, use that uh, organization to create awareness uh, more of these different events. So I guess it's a way of uh, saying that uh, these kind of things, when you add it to Chris, Kristen's uh, presentation, uh, kind of gives you an idea that uh, between 66 and 71 was a window, if you can imagine this uh, window of time that's moving across that period where all these different rights issues were being uh, in the nation's consciousness. And uh, here we are trying to get a settlement because the reason for that was the state of Alaska had, a settle, uh, had its own settlement and it was beginning to encroach with their land selections on traditional native lands. And if it weren't for AFN's uh, efforts to create or help Stuart Udall do a land freeze, uh, I think the scenario would have been a lot different. Uh, <clears throat> so I just wanted to kind of raise the level of uh, anxiety that was occurring back in that time. And uh, it just created uh, a whole 
concerted effort. Uh, people were going on the John and Carson show. They were talking to unions. They were talking to uh, international forums. Uh, the various church groups across uh, America were all uh, being met with uh, different native leaders who were telling their story. And uh, that was very successful. So I'll leave it, for, I'll leave it there. And I promise I can go faster so that we can hear from you more. <laughs> okay, passage of thanks are going very fast. Um, so when we think about what actually, you know, led, pushed us over the edge, got angst at past, something very important happened in 1968. The oil was discovered in Prudhoe Bay. It was discovered by Atlantic Richfield Oil Company, or ARCO. It was originally contained approximately 25 billion barrels. Of course, a lot of that has already flown down the pipeline. And, and that was the dilemma. You know, we, we can't leave the oil up there, so how do we build a pipeline? that It was envisioned pretty early on that it would go down through the state and end up in Valdez. How could they build that pipeline um, with all of these ownership issues up in, air, in the air? I pulled this picture off the internet, and I actually think that might be my father if the picture weren't so blurry, because he was the land surveyor who surveyed the discovery well. And it looked a lot like him, and it seemed about the right height, but that's an aside. So when we, when we say what drove ANCSA, um, it was the discovery of oil. And it was also Interior Secretary Udall's imposition of the land freeze. And he said that until the Alaska Native land claims are settled, the state of Alaska can't pick any land. Um, any other interested parties can't. It was literally frozen. And so all of these different um, parties along the way, they knew that they needed clean title to build the pipeline. Um, prior to that point, there really hadn't been any recognition of native lands or land claims, except for those little tiny ones that I showed you in that um, non-indigenous occupation era. And that didn't really result to much passing over to the hands of Alaska natives. Uh, other things that drove ANCSA was there were um, this was one report that was done, the Committee on Interior and Insular Affairs, a uh, congressionally mandated uh, research project looking to determine what the kind of the state of Alaska Natives was. And it came back, and this was pre ANCSA, and had these really alarming st statistics. At that point, the average age of death was less than 35 years. People went out to Alaska Native villages and looked at the housing, and they said of some 7,500 dwellings, 7,100 needed replaced. The level of formal education was typically less than eight years. Only 9% of Alaska Natives were completing high school and less than 1% graduating from college. And so in, in addition to the, the rush to get oil to market, uh, people in Congress thought that, well, if we settle the land claims, maybe this is going to do something to improve the socioeconomic status of Alaska Natives. So again, you know, what drove ANCSA? There were a lot of interested parties in Alaska land, land claims, and there's probably some that I've left off this slide. We've definitely got the federal government. They wanted the state of Alaska and the Alaska Natives to finished up their land selection so they knew what was going to be left to them. And we had municipalities and other local governments that were interested. Of course, Alaska Native groups, private landholders, the oil companies, and environmentalists, too. Um, like Jim was saying, Alaska Natives put themselves and their land issues into the um, public awareness in Alaska and elsewhere, and people realized that um, we, they needed to step in and preserve some of the natural beauty of Alaska. Um, this, is a, just, this is a picture of getting ANCSA passed, Alaska Natives sitting down. We've got Senator Ted Stevens there. He was very um, new to Congress at this time. Um, he's widely considered to be a real friend and advocate for Alaska Native ca causes. Um, so we've got a lot of the, a lot of the famous people, uh, Don Wright, um, whose name I've mentioned, and, and so on and so forth. 
um, coming, coming down to Washington to get this bill passed. So when we think about what ANCSA created, ultimately, 12 regional corporations, there was a 13th, it, it, they, it was created after, and it, it went away due to, due to bankruptcy after, but initially 12 regional corporations, over 200 um, plus village corporations, but no tribes. And I put that on there because I think that there's, that's kind of a, um, something that, that, that people, um, sometimes associate tribes with ANCSA, and ANCSA did not address that at all. So it didn't create any tribes. What was, and I've got given in quotes because, of course, nobody gave us anything, we, you know, all, all that. Um, so ANCSA gave title to 44 million acres of land in Alaska. There was also a cash component of the settlement, but it was cash that was given to recognize and compensate Alaska Natives for land that was previously taken that couldn't be given back. Um, so that represents a pretty big chunk of land. Um, in, the, in the way that, it, that, that things flowed is the money from the settlement flowed to the regional corporations who then shared it with the village corporations. The land selection, um, both regionals and village corporations could select land. And village corporations could, not all did, but they could take some of the land that was given to them and um, give it to individuals uh, in their village. So the Grand Compromise, um, the fight for land climbs, claims required people to rise above their own personal needs and work with others despite differences in opinion and culture. So amongst the varying regions, of course, not everything was unanimous, but people were able to reach consensus. Um, they were, and they were united because the fight was an effort to hold on to their land and create a better world for their children. So differences could be put aside. People were very wise in recognizing that Washington was going to listen to them much more closely if they came with one voice. So who owned the, lo the land post ANCSA? The federal government with, was left with about 60 uh, percent of the state of Alaska, 197 million acres. The state of Alaska, about 30 percent, some of this is lost in rounding, 124 million acres. And Alaska Natives ended up getting 44 million acres, or about 10 percent. And also some money in compensation for the lands already claimed. So with regard to the Alaska land conveyances, the law required that natives set up village and regional corporations to obtain title to the land. That was the entity required. Um, you have to have some type of holding company in order to receive the cash and to receive the title. So it was required that they were set up as corporations. You can look out on the state of Alaska Department of Commerce and you can see where the Alaska Native Regional Corporations and the Village Corporations have filed their articles of incorporation and their bylaws. And in that sense, they're like any other kind of Western type of corporation. Um, the land, so because of the way it passed to the corporations, that 44 million acres in land n didn't belong to individuals, except for those rare exceptions where, where some of the villages granted it, it belonged to corporations. Congress has gone on record stating that they wanted Alaska Natives to become shareholders and businesses to become part of the commercial and corporate mainstream of America. And they really thought that this could be um, the kind of startup capital, if you will, for Alaska Natives to go forth and prosper. Some of the requirements were that um, 
Well, the establishment of 12 regional corporations at some time after ANCSA passed, people in the lower 48 said, what about us? And so they set up a 13th corporation, gave some money but no land to Alaska Natives who weren't represented. Um, it established more than 200 village corporations, and it had certain requirements. Um, individuals had to be at least one quarter Alaska Native and born before December 18, 1971. A large number of Alaska Natives had to work with the Bureau of Indian Affairs to get documentation in order to get their certificates of Indian blood to prove up that 25% blood quantum. Most people ended up enrolling in both a regional corporation and a village corporation. People would have the choice of enrolling in the regional corporation, either from their heritage or from they were currently living. For my family, I could have been a C Alaska shareholder, but we were living in Anchorage at, at the time, so my family enrolled with Siri. Um, most people then would tra trace their heritage back and uh, their family's heritage back and enroll also as a shareholder of a village corporation. There were some, some Alaska Natives who, you know, due to family migrating around for any number of reasons, weren't closely associated with any village land base, didn't have a village corporation to enroll in, and they became then what was at-large shareholders. But most people became shareholders of both a regional and a village corporation at the time. Um, Six of the, of the original corporations divided amongst themselves 16 million acres. And so they didn't take the 44 million and um, divide it equally among the 12 regional corporations. They looked at how much land was used in, this, in the different language groups, what the migration patterns were, how much land they traditionally used and occupied. So when you look at the maps, you'll see some big differences in the land allotments between the regional corporations. These are the 12 regional corporations that were formed. A lot of familiar names, a lot of familiar logos. These are the 12. Um, this is a table that shows at the time of ANCSA how many original shareholders each corporation had and then how much um, land was given and how much initial cash was given. So you can see that Doyon um, received the most amount of land and that was based on the fact that the Doyon people, they had a very large area that they migrated around following the, following the herds, following the resources. On the other hand, Southeast was really kind of condensed and compact. It had also been occupied um, to a great larger extent by the Western um, influences, so there was less land available there. So it wasn't just split into 12 even pie slices. Um, ANCSA created 220 plus village corporations. They received title to 22 million of the 44 million acres um, under ANCSA. And it was a very complicated land selection process because so much land was already conveyed. I saw a really good presentation um, given by Aaron Shoot talking about the Doyon process and the villages would know what land they wanted but there was already kind of a, a patchwork or quilted effect of the land already taken. So sometimes they would work with their regional corporation and between the two of them they would select as much land as possible for their village then sometimes they would enter into private sales to kind of fill in the blanks but it was very rare for any of the villages to get a contiguous area of land surrounding their traditional village area just because of the prior claims to that property. The villages um, received only surface title to the land. And so, you know, they could build anything they wanted on the land, but if they dug down and, and discovered gold or oil or any type of mineral, 
that was a subsurface asset and that belonged to the regional corporations. Timber is included in the subsurface category, even though you know it's clearly trees are above the ground, but it was a considered a natural resource. And the intent of this was to do some revenue leveling across the 12 organizations. It was recognized that, of course, there would be um, you know, some level of unfairness on who got the richer land and who got the poorer land. And by, um, by giving the subsurface to the regionals, and I'll show in a little bit, and then placing upon them these sharing provisions, that then there would be some revenue equalization amongst the uh, regional corporations. And this, this is why the village corporations only got the surface um, rights to their land. The villages, it's interesting because at the time they were told that they needed to form corporations. They had the option of forming either as nonprofit corporations, which would mean that they'd be charitable organizations, um, you know, with a purpose of, you know, just providing uh, good to their to their shareholders. But they all joined as signed up as for-profit corporations because they anticipated being able to turn their resources and their land into future dividends for their shareholders. This is pretty hard to read this big, but these are, is a representation of the lands withdrawn for selection by native corporations. And so you can see the, um, you know, it's, it, it doesn't represent anywhere near the 90% of the land that was historically used and occupied. And you can even get a sense of kind of that um, checkerboard pattern around some of these land selections because so much of what was desired to be taken was already set aside or claimed by the federal and state governments. This is a look at all of the native entities in Alaska. It's the closest thing I could find to a true representation of the number of village corporations in the state of Alaska. At the time Anxa passed, there were 220 plus village corporations. Right now there are 179, I believe. And some of the village corporations went out, went, became bankrupt. Um, that's not the main explanation. Other village corporations decided to um, band together and form a consortium type village corporation. They realized that they would be able to do more for their communities if they pooled their resources. And especially for some of the villages that were in close proximity to each other, that made sense. So if you, instead of having nine small clinics, why not put our resources together and have one larger clinic? So there's a lot of things that have changed the look of this. Um, a village perspective. Village corporations, when we look at the land selections, the amount of land that the village corporations got um, was a function of their of the people that enrolled to the village corporation. So people had to be, you know, tallied up in the villages and if their enrollment was 25 to 99, they were entitled to three townships. In a township, that representation on the left there, the, the grid, would be a standard township. Um, depending on the number of enrollees, it determined the number of townships and the number of anchors. An exception to that was in the southeast. Those village corporations could only choose a single township of smaller anchor acreage, and this was justified by the fact that they won that cash settlement back in the day. So it was used as a reason to give them less now. Um, this is also an example on the, the grid at the left. Some of the village corporations would take one of the squares in their town site and they would make that available for individual allotments to give some land to um, members of their village. And Alaska Natives who received land under this mechanism, they would actually own that land. 
be simple. Um, one thing about the land that was owned by the corporations was it was not held in trust with the federal government. There were some restrictions on selling inks of land, but not due to the federal trust relationship. Anything to add there, Jim? Yeah, there was um, a lot of uh, mergers early on. Um, for example, uh, all the villages in the Nana region merged to to Nana, except for Kotzebue. Um, all of the villages in the Atna region merged with uh, with the Atna Regional Corporation, except I think Chitna. And then in the Chilista region. Uh, Ten villages merged uh, into themselves, creating the Kuskokwim Corporation, uh, and uh, consequently they have their own uh, uh, corporation of merged villages of some ten villages, and their corresponding nonprofit. Uh, just to kind of add to that. This is an example of um, village corporations in the Cook Inlet region. And so for each of the regional corporation, they have their villages. And so in the Cook Inlet region, these are their native villages, Aklutna, Kanik, et cetera. Um, this, this map also shows some villages that were never able to be certified as villages. And this didn't just happen in the Cook Inlet region, but the law was essentially that if you wanted to be certified as a, as a village, you needed to be able to show that at least 25 Alaska Native people lived on that land, you know, going back sometime in history that they continuously used and occupied it. And so, Alexander Creek, Caswell, Gold Creek, Montana Creek, they all made petitions to get certified as uh, Alaska Native villages so that they could participate in ANCSA, but they weren't able to prove up their claims. And those, that's a similar story throughout many of the, the villages, but technically non-villages non throughout the state of Alaska. When we look, and I'm just using Siri as an example, um, for one, it's the land, and you know, also just because I'm more familiar with it because it's my corporation. Here, if you look at, on the one side, we show the villages in the Siri region, and then we look at the Anks of Village Corporations. There's you know, a relationship between all of those. Um, and also, side by side with that, are federally recognized tribes. So the ANCSA village corporations clearly created from ANCSA federally recognized tribes. They share something in common with the villages and they also had to prove um, the population, that the population was there, that they'd been there over time. Um, and they had some additional requirements that they had to um, satisfy the federal government of, but I think that it's a common misconception that perhaps the village corporations are tribes, which they're not. And some of the village corporations, if they have a name like Nanilchik Native Association, because it doesn't have that word corporation in there, it's easy to mistake it for a tribe when it's actually Nanilchik Traditional Council that is the tribe. Anxa Regional and Anxa Village Corporations do have some limited tribal authority, but they do not have any sovereignty. They cannot enact constitutions, and so they're very much not tribes. Um, a really important part of Anxa, this is another kind of um, way to think about how really creative they were and how they were able to get this grand compromise passed even when there were so many different Alaska Native leaders and different resources in all of the regions. So there's seven I revenue sharing pr provisions. And this is addressing um, the potential, since the potential for resource development dif differed amongst the regions, this was a way um, to help equalize the revenues. And Section 7I states that 
70% of all of the revenues received by each regional corporation from timber resources and subsurface. And remember, even if the village has got the rights to the top of the land, <laughs> the surface, the regional owns what's underneath it. That that shall be divided annually by the regional corporation among all the 12 regional corporations according to the number of natives enrolled in each region. Um, so you, if, you, if you think about each of these regional corporations, see Alaska, if they earn a million dollars from timber resources, they're going to need to put 700,000 of that in the 7i pot. If someone makes money from oil, they're going to need to put 70% of that in the 7i pot. And then that what's in the pot gets spread back around back to the regional corporations. And then after that happens, the regional corporations have to distribute at least 50% of that out to their village corporations, again, based on enrollment. This, these are some charts that show the magnitude of the 7i revenues that have been received from all of the regional corporations. Um, so starting in the early 80s, it really wasn't much. This chart just goes out to 2015, but you can see that um, you, you know, from 2005 to 2015, you know, 100 million, 200 million, nearly 300 million, a significant amount of money going into 7i. This is a chart that looks at the sources of the income. Um, it divides it by timber, mining, oil, and gas. So in the early days, it was oil and gas. In the, in the 90s, it switched to timber. And then in the more contemporary times, we see that the 7i revenue is fairly evenly split here between oil, gas, and, and mining. This is the cumulative 7i revenue paid by resource type. This is the chart to focus on. It has inflation-adjusted numbers. Um, so inflation-adjusted, $3.2 in 7i revenue has been collected and redistributed under this program. When we, um, and this, this came from a report that was done by the McDowell Group. And they, took, they had some selected comments from the village corporations um, talking about how they're, so it goes, it's 7i when it first goes into the pot, and then it's called 7j when it gets distributed back out to the village corporations, that they use these payments for scholarships, investments, administrative costs, paying debt, Another village corporation said that their funds go solely towards shareholder dividends, which their shareholders depend upon. Uh, 7J payments are the lifeblood for small village corporations, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this has been a, a really important source of economic sustainability for the village corporations. We had, I teach an undergraduate Alaska Native governance class, and I had the students step, step out of the Blackboard environment and look up village corporations. And, you know, one student reported that his village corporation, it only had 66 um, shareholders, and since it's on a per shareholder basis, essentially, you know, they, they had a very small village corporation and 7J income didn't amount to much. Another student reported back from a village corporation that had over 3,000 shareholders. And so their 7J revenue was pretty significant. Um, I've really showed that in the chart, so I don't think I need to cover that slide. Perfect. Most of you know that uh, Alaska's, all, most of Alaska's industries are extractive in nature. Um, a lot of the tourism dollars uh, leave the state. Um, all of the mining uh, revenues that are generated um, by non-native corporations leave the state, timber, uh, fisheries, uh, especially oil and gas, especially uh, primarily ex are extractive 
and those resources and the money uh, goes uh, out of the state. Alaska Native corporations are the only ones that uh, actually bring money into the state. And consistently for the last five or 10 years, they have exceeded uh, $10 billion of revenues that are brought back into Alaska in, in a variety of ways. So I just wanted to show you a little contrast and comparison and contrast that um, in these trying times that our state's economy is in, Actually, it's the native corporations that are are kind of showing things up, in my opinion. Thank you. In in the ANCSA course, when uh, Roy Hundorf was talking to the students, he thought it would be a, a really great project for an econo economist to figure out what the gross domestic product of Alaska Native corporations was, and not just the to their total revenue, but to really go through all the iterations of an economic anal analysis. How much does the money circulate? What other industries does it provide? Because he thinks that most of the published numbers for the, the wealth that Alaska Native corpor ANCSA corporations bring into the states underestimate the true value and that we would really need that GDP type of analysis in order to, to have it done. Um, I talked about that one. So when we talk about the benefits of 7i and 7j, just to recap, it does produce economic leveling between the regions. Um, and certainly there are corporations who have put more into uh, 7i than they've gotten back. And I was reading the very interesting paper written by um, Aaron and Ethan shoot about 7i and 7j and in the early days the, the actual language in ANCSA about how this works is very short and it talks about the concept but it doesn't speak to the implementation so there were quite a number of lawsuits going back and forth amongst the uh, corporations you know and, and needing to hash out well what do you mean revenue and as a finance accounting person there's different definitions and what costs are allowable um, and how soon do we need to to pay and so there was this famous meeting in Warm Springs Oregon in was it the early 80s? Um, and the, the source that I read said that all of the regional presidents and their lawyers went down and said, um, we, we can't keep fighting each other in courts. We're going to have nothing left to fight over if we keep giving it to our attorneys. And so they were determined to stay there until they worked out a skeleton agreement for how the 7i and the 7j was actually going to work. And it took some time after that for all of the details to get finalized, but they got the spirit of it right. And they also, um, and, and this is language that's amended in ANCSA, they also decided that no amendments to ANCSA concerning anything could be done without the unanimous consent of all of the regions. And I think they thought, well, if we can come to agreement on 7i and 7j, then let's just hold to that so that we always are unanimous and that we, you know, can, can go forward, you know, for seven generations to come in unity, you know, for the good of all the, all the future generations to come. Yeah, in fact, at one time it was uh, before the settlement uh, of 7i and 7j, we were starting to call it the uh, retirement plan for accountants and attorneys. <laughs> and if it wasn't for Byron Malad and other Native leaders who basically got the rest of us to kick our attorneys and accountants uh, out of the room and just, and just spend the time with each other and... Uh, uh, we, like Kristen said, we, they found a way to do it and uh, it's been with us ever since. <laughs>
Before we get really close to our closing time, I got to talk about a couple amendments. Um, when ANCSA was originally passed, it, it had language in it that allowed for the sale of stock in 1991. I think the original crafters thought after 20 years, they'll be you know, in a good stable position and if any shareholders want to sell their stock, why not? Well, there were a lot of good why nots. Um, for one, if shareholders sold their stock, the likely buyers would be non-Alaska natives, and if enough shareholders made that choice, then you could envision a future where non-Alaska natives had the majority control over the ANCSA regional corporations, and the, nobody wanted that. Also fears of the fact that they were still, they, they hadn't quite come to their full potential yet, the corporation. So there was, I wouldn't say they were floundering, but they weren't as financially strong as they could. And so people were afraid that people would swarm on them like a fire sale and take advantage of, of the Alaska Native corporations. So it's, it's, these amendments happened in, 88, but they're called the 91 Amendments, and I'm not exactly sure why that is. So I call them 98 Amendments, and sometimes you see them as 91. Um, but in 1988, ANCSA was amended to prohibit the sale of stock in perpetuity unless the shareholders of the ANC vote, voted to amend the Articles of Incorporation to remove the restrictions of stock sales. So as it is now, no shareholder can sell their stock. You can gift it, you can leave it in your will, um, you can bequeath it, but you can't sell it. Um, they also put language in the amendment that authorized Native corporations to provide health, education, or welfare benefits to their shareholders. And this was important because it, um, it, it enabled the ANCSAs to expand their missions. It enabled them to set up nonprofits to, that had health education or welfare missions and then set up these nonprofits in such a way that the nonprofits too would have limited tribal authority to go after things like federal contracts and compacts to, to take over the management of our own healthcare uh, services. So that was an important piece of the amendment. Also in this one, 88 or 99, one amendment, shareholders could vote to, um, to let the corporation issue new classes of stock. One of the big concerns about ANCSA was that you could not be a shareholder if you were born after December 18, 1971. And so you hear stories of families where one sibling is a shareholder and the, the next kid in line was born after that date and they were really left out. I have one sister who was born in November of 1971 and so she just barely made it or else we would have had that situation. Yeah, no, just, just barely. So this allowed corporations to make some provisions to include the, um, there's a term, afterborns, um, that's used a lot. It doesn't sound very good to say it. I'm s stuck with nothing better to, to describe that. So, so Six of the 12 corporations now have established another class of shareholder, and they have opened up their, their shareholder enrollment to include um, people born after that date. There were also some people who just missed out on their opportunity to enroll. They didn't know about it. Maybe they were in the military, a number of reasons. And for the longest time, it was just like too bad. You, you, you missed your opportunity. So this allowed people to add to, allowed corporations to add those shareholders to their books. And they also gave them a chance to have a special category of shareholders for the 65 and older group. And so a lot of the corporations have their regular dividends and then they have another dividend distribution for their elders. It's all, be all because of these amendments. Um, I think this is a little bit of a duplicative slide. Here I've switched to the 91 and 92 amendments. Expanded shareholder eligibility. Um, 
removed the blood quantum requirement that was originally set in ANCSA. That's one that I didn't have on the previous slide. So if corporations for those different classes of stock for people who were born after uh, December 19th, December 1871, they no longer had to have a 25% blood quantum like the original um, sharehold, ANCSA shareholders. That is it for the ANCSA presentation. I have a couple just thoughts going forward, but. Yeah, I could add a couple of things. Um, number one, the uh, reason for the 1991 amendments really began because there was two clauses in ANCSA that are considered sunset clauses. And in 20 years from the date of the act, you could sell your stock, as Kristen mentioned, but also your lands could be taxed. And uh, that needs to be emphasized. Uh, it got to become a point of contention because uh, at one time uh, people were starting to look at ANCSA as a termination bill because on one hand they give it to you and then 20 years later they take it away. And so um, the 91 amendments that was passed in 1988 uh, was uh, basically a menu of things that village and regional corporations can do to enact what's generally called super majorities uh, to prevent sale of stock and, and the sale of land. And if there is gonna be land that was developed to make sure that it was the smallest possible tract and so that you don't get taxed for the whole uh, amount of land that you got but only for that small part that got developed. So these are kind of little things that are not often uh, talked about. Are there any questions before we come to our conclusion tonight? Any closing comments, Jim? Could we say that again? No. <laughs> I just, I just want to say that um, I really have an honor of being here and having APU and Kristen and invite me to participate. It's, it's meaningful for me because I was a non-traditional student in uh, 1971 here at this university uh, and was invited to the Atwood Center uh, on December 18th, 1971. I stood in the back of the room and we were all straining to listen to that little squawk box where President Nixon said, I'm about to sign the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. <laughs> and some three or 400 native leaders that had come together from all over Alaska and that had been in that fight for six years, uh, the excitement was just palpable, it was just just so exciting, and uh, I can still re remember listening to one uh, one of the leaders uh, say, now what do we do? <laughs> and of course that now what do we do part means we need to implement it. And that's another story. And, um, and it's implemented in, in different ways by different villages and regions. But I would really like to have you be mindful to go to uh, the uh, website alaskol.org, um, seek out people like uh, Emil Nadi and Willie Hensley and uh, Sam Keto and uh, <coughs> Roy Hundar and these kind of folks. Uh, Irene Rowan has a wonderful set of uh, series at 40, Anxa at 40, uh, where she uh, I believe there's about nine or 10 uh, DVDs of just amazing uh, interviews and panel discussions uh, of a lot of things that we talked to today about, but are actually coming from those people who were actually involved. And, and we should do well to try to find those and show them if we can. <laughs>
getting a little more face-to-face. Uh, you would have heard a lot more from Jim than from me. I would have realized that, you know, I've, I'd gone too long without checking in from him. But he, he's been a tremendous support to me. I had a lot of nervousness and trepidation over this. And after our first ca- coffee meeting, I was like, okay, I can do it because I've got Jim alongside me. And it just made a huge difference. I can't say thank you to him enough for making this possible. Just oil and mineral rights and timber. But your question does uh, call for a concern because um, we have things like globalization and uh, climate change that's going to have a tremendous impact on all of the the lands and primarily primarily the surface estate. Uh, I'm really concerned that... uh, we have a lot of communities along our major rivers who depend on fish uh, that are starting to see changes in the uh, in the number and the quality of the of fish that's going up their streams, and uh, and of course they're also in competition with uh, that group outside of Alaska, outside of our shores that are catching these bottom fish, and a lot of uh, andronomous fish are byproducts to that and we're not to my knowledge getting the benefit from uh, from that and these are kind of questions and policy things that i think this current generation and and, and onward need to begin thinking about and addressing And that goes for me, too. And there is one more resource. I I don't know uh, if Utkiavik has the capacity to share the... Uh, they own the Tundra Times, the rights to Tundra Times. And there's just a whole wealth of information uh, that was generated over that time period that could actually really be beneficial to researchers, to policymakers, students... Oh, very good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, Gabe's, who's from Utkavik, says that um, the Tundra Times is online with uh, UAF and the and the Tuzzy Library. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. 